Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Um, I just want to ask, from now on, I need your permission. Before I get up and preach every Sunday, can we do that song we open the service with? The moving song with everyone running around? Uh, that would be interesting. Get everyone energized, right? Um, but anyway, I am uh, very glad. I'm glad that Brian clarified on the prison comments, you know, Max. We didn't want to be work. We were going to start a prayer chain. Someone already asked me. But, um. <laughs> as we get started this morning, as we get into the Bible passage that we're going to be talking about, I want to tell this story. On June 16th of 1858, a rather tall man like myself got up and accepted the nomination for the U.S. Senate seat for the state of Illinois in Springfield at the state capitol. And that man spoke these uh, now fairly famous words. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect this house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will, it will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is, is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Now, that was said, of course, by Abraham Lincoln, and it was the speech there very early on as he's accepting this nomination uh, from his party, and he will ultimately fail to get the Senate seat. And there, if you fast forward in history just a little bit further, on April 12th of 1861, less than three years later, would begin the battle on Fort, Fort Sumter in South Carolina, which would launch the Civil War. A house divided will fall. We cannot continue in this state. And so those words became ingrained in history because they had somewhat of an almost, almost, dare we say, prophetic nature. Today, we use this phrase, a house divided, as a bumper sticker on our cars to describe disagreements we have over sports fandom. My own truck has a picture of no, a, a logo of uh, the Georgia Bulldogs. Is that from Georgia? Um, the Florida Gators, because my wife is from Florida, and the Atlanta Braves. And if you think that that A is an Alabama A, you are wrong. It is an Atlanta Braves A. Pay attention a little swirly on the top. Okay. <laughs> It's as if this house divided phrase doesn't have the same gravity it once held. But its origin is from a story um, in the Bible. It was Jesus Christ says this. You see, Lincoln actually quoted Jesus on the house divided part. And it wasn't about some impending civil war, but about a current spiritual war. That underneath all of this, this world that we live in, all that we see, uh, even though it is so divided, it's because underneath of all that is the battle that is to now unseen. And that we might see one day. Now, I'll be honest, um, and I think I should put this caveat out there. I am a naturally skeptical person. I have a tendency to question everything, to humanize spiritual concepts, to disbelieve the unprovable, and to explore every explanation I can get. I mean, I have my faith in Christ, but I get nervous sometimes when people talk about the spiritual war behind all of our world. It, it makes me think that some people think they know more about it than they 
really do. But unfortunately, with all of my skepticism, today's passage is actually about people like me. And perhaps people like you. And so if you've got your Bibles, I want you um, to open them up to Luke chapter 11. Now we have the scripture, we're going to have it on the screen. Um, I'm going to read all the way through this uh, passage, beginning in verse 14. If you've got your Bibles, or if you're looking at the screen, please follow along. It just uh, ensures that we know what we're talking about today, and we can get into these uh, passages, the words of God. Now, in Luke 11, beginning in verse 14, we have this story, and it's one that is going to sound strange to our ears. I mean, to a modern person, a skeptic like me, uh, this is just plain bizarre, but I want us to bear with this a little longer and get the gist in its own time and place of why it makes sense, and more than that, why it matters to us. So verse 14, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. We're, okay, we're into demons, we're already into an odd place for us. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Okay, now we just brought out the name Beelzebul. We're into a strange passage. And uh, we have some rather bizarre things going on. Now we keep going. Verse 17. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. Okay, there's your quote, right? If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. And here, they take this last verse. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, we are, of course, in our series on the kingdom of God. And as we back up and we look at this passage, we'll probably notice a lot of strange things. And number one, let's bring up the most obvious. That is, we're talking about demons here. Something that doesn't uh, come into my conversation on a day-to-day -day basis. Perhaps it does for you. But we go around and you know, there are a lot of theories about why the New Testament talks about it so frequently. Um, and yet there it is, shown again and again, Jesus driving out demons. And there are some who want to be uh, able to interpret it in a, light, in a slightly different way and say that maybe demons are the way that ancient people described illnesses or mental illnesses or something of this nature. And perhaps maybe that might be true. Or maybe it is literal more in a way than we realize. Or maybe we misunderstand part of it today. I don't know. And I'm skeptical enough and willing to say I'm not sure. But here we are talking about demons. And then we go a little further, and Jesus has been driving out these demons. They accuse him of doing it um, through a different power than that of God. In fact, he's doing it through the power of Satan. And I want you to look back at um, verse 16. I found this really humorous. Others tested him, Jesus, by asking for a sign from heaven. I want you to think about what just happened. There are spirits screaming as they come out of a man, dark apparitions sailing by our ears, men unable to speak, now singing praises to God, and they want a sign from heaven. Have you ever been that kind of uh, dense? <laughs> I mean, really? You want a sign from heaven? What did you just see? And so instead of accepting that God has acted in a powerful way, they're um, determined to find some other explanation for it. It cannot possibly be 
God's work. And so I'll think of something else. I'll say it was, well, I don't know, it, it was the devil. Have you ever blamed the devil for something you didn't have an explanation for? My French fry disappeared. It was the devil. See, they can't find another explanation. They don't want to admit that there might be some presence of God, some action of God, some work going on before their very eyes. So instead, they've got to find some other way of explaining it. And we wouldn't necessarily do this in our day and age, but they will, and they'll say it's by Beelzebub. I've got to find some other way of explaining it. It wasn't God acting. We have ways of doing kind of similar things. Maybe not exactly, but we, we say, oh, you know, I can't believe that happened. He must have sold his soul to get that. Kind of similar, or we find other ways to explain away the good things that happen in our life and the actions of God. We say it was a coincidence. It was a matter of random chance. It was, you know, just our own wishful positive thinking, or it was the placebo effect. These good things happen for some other reason, cannot admit God's working. You know, it, will, uh, it, it won't last very long. It'll go back to bad soon. I don't know how it happened, but it can't possibly be God. We find another explanation. And Jesus comes back with this argument. That's where the quote comes in. And that's the one we often don't understand. But he says, wait a minute. You're arguing that I'm driving out demons by Satan? Satan doesn't fight against himself. Uh, that wouldn't make any sense. His whole kingdom, his whole household, everything would just crumble. That You know that inherently. It's obvious. What's going on is that you just can't accept that God is working. Because if this is God, if this is from God, if he is acting, then... And here's that last verse, then the kingdom of God is here and now. If you accept that God is working in this moment, then the kingdom of God is here now. And that's why you can't accept it, because if the kingdom of God is here and now, that means that Jesus would be the Messiah, because he's the one bringing it in. That would mean that these people would have to change their lives if they accepted that God was doing something amazing here. The kingdom of God was actually present here and now. They would have to change something. They would have to believe that Jesus was who he said he was and not some um, guy who's cheating them or, or fooling people. And whenever you come up with that fact that if you admit that God is working and active, then your life would have to change. You'd have to believe that Jesus had power. Then you will usually find some other explanation so you don't have to make those changes. No wonder they'll blame Satan or anyone for this happening. No wonder. Because if they accept that Christ is doing it, then the kingdom of heaven is here now, and everything changes. Maybe they didn't want to do that. Have you ever... Um, denied God's involvement in your life because you didn't really want to change your life that much. You wanted to deny that he was convicting you to do something because you didn't want to have to do that something. You didn't want to admit that God was calling you to change your life and turn it around and abandon that sin because you didn't want to do that. You didn't want to admit that God is working in our world, because if he was, then you might have to be a part of it. And life wouldn't be as much fun. I don't think that's true, but it's a way of thinking. Have you ever denied the obvious, come up with a ridiculous way around the explanation just to put off the decision? Because it always seems logical to be skeptical. But it's not helpful. I would say, today, it's time to give God His glory. It's time to accept that God has been pulling you. It's time to accept that God has been acting. To stop blaming something else or explaining it in some other way or avoid
avoiding coming to a decision. It's time to give God the glory for what he is doing. Now, for those of you who have been in church for a while or remember some things from your young, when you were younger, you may remember that this story that we're telling today, as bizarre as, as it is, as far out there and different and odd to modern ears, is the context in which we sometimes come up with this rather difficult conversation about something we call the unforgivable sin. Have you heard this right? It's kind of the opposite. We always say Christ can forgive anything, but, but there's this unforgivable sin. And so they'll go through this passage and they'll find the part where Jesus talks about what's called blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, I know we're getting bizarre or I'm making you nervous already. I can see it. But this is the context. And within this context, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, as best as I can tell, appears to be denying that God or the Holy Spirit is working. It's attributing to the impossible, or attributing the impossible to impossibly ridiculous reasons. And it's not meant to be a source of anxiety for Christians. It's not something supposed to keep us away at night. I hope I haven't done that. It's supposed to be an argument to simply call a spade a spade. And when God is working, to acknowledge it. To not say that, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's not the Holy Spirit, that's Satan. It would be inherently offensive. And so I want us this week to look around our lives and try to identify and give God credit when he's working. When we see the kingdom of God acted, instead of explaining it as coincidence or a random chance or wishful thinking, to actually stop and give God credit. So, Here's my idea. It's out there. You'll have to forgive me. I'm a young guy. But I want us to collect our, yep, that's Jesus stories. Do you understand what I mean by that? I want us to be thinking this week, um, watching something happen and realize, yep, that's Jesus. Because we don't acknowledge it very often. We don't often give God the glory he deserves. Sometimes we see him act and don't bother thanking him. Or we see him act and assume that it happened in some other way. Because we're inherently skeptical like I am, like the Pharisees were. And now there are a lot of different ways to participate in this. Um, for those of you who are young and hip, not like me at all, but if you are, um, we're going to make a hashtag out of this. You know what that is? That's a little number thing. Or as I call it, tic-tac-toe. You do, you do hashtag, yep, that's Jesus. You can do that on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. They all do the same thing. And then that means that this week I can go and type in and search, yep, that's Jesus. And all of those stories that are tagged that way come up. Now, if you're not terribly um, technologically savvy, raise your hands. <laughs> you don't need to do that at all. Um, what you could do is go on our Facebook page and, and tell us a little story or send me an email or call me on the phone. I actually still get phone service. Um, I don't use it often, but I have it. Or walk into my office and tell me a yep, that's Jesus moment. Look through your life and give God credit for something. Stop denying it. Stop attributing the work of God to something else. Because that's where we fail to see the kingdom of God is here, among us, and happening. And so I guess um, I'll take the time now to tell you my own little yep, that's Jesus moment. <coughs> you ready? It's exciting. Are you excited? Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> Uh, sometime, oh boy, was it, I think it was a year ago, um, Jen and I decided we wanted to go watch a baseball game. I love baseball. Um, I'm from Georgia, so I'm sorry I'm not a St. Louis Cardinals fan. I was waiting for a reaction here. <laughs> okay, we don't have that perfect. Okay. That was perfect. All right. Um, but there was a, a game, uh, the Braves were actually playing the Royals up in Kansas City.
city and I wanted to go up there and watch it. And Jen and I were driving up there and it was one of those moments that we really wanted to forget, but I can't ever forget about it. But we were driving up there um, in Kansas City, it was getting a little bit crowded, and of course I didn't know where I was going, which describes about 90% of my existence. <laughs> Not just in the car, I mean anywhere. And we're up there driving through Kansas City, and I'm looking around at all of the signs uh, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going, and I'm getting over into this lane, and I'm looking around, and all of a sudden, my wife lets out one of those things, unless you know you made a mistake. You ever heard that sound? <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I don't know how she makes that sound, but I don't know. It always scares me, though, immediately. And it might not be a big deal, it might be, um, you know, that I'm still a mile away from someone, but I'm getting closer to them, but it always scares me. In this case, it was more or less true. Um, I didn't see that they were breaking in front of me, like, quickly. And so, I hear this sound, I see they're breaking in front of me, and I kind of slam on the brakes, right? Um, and for some reason, when you're going you're 65 down the interstate and stop quickly, it tends to make you swerve. And so there we are in the middle of the interstate, um, fishtailing. More than that, my tire back of my car is sort of turning all the way around, so I'm almost facing the wrong direction. And I am braced. I'm ready to be hit and have a very long day. And worst of all, to miss my baseball game. But for some reason, uh, the grace of God or, or, or whatever, everyone seemed to see it stopped and or went around us. We sat there for a couple of minutes, looked around, gathered ourselves, not a couple of minutes, maybe 30 seconds. Turned the car back, <coughs> turned the car around, got going again, as if nothing had ever happened. Now, I am one of those natural skeptics and I'll say, well, you know, I got lucky. Or, uh, other people were paying really good attention, or so on and so forth, but in the end, if I were to not give credit to Christ, I'd really be missing out on something, right? I'd be denying the work of God in my life. I'd be failing to be grateful. And you know what? You noticed I never told that story to the whole church, did I? Because I was embarrassed. <laughs> But it's time I tell that story, because, yep, that was Jesus. It's time that we stop associating things with random chance. It's time that we stop um, denying that the kingdom of heaven is here, that our world is divided, that we stop denying that things are going to change one day, that we stop saying that God isn't active, that everything is random chance, that everything or just molecules going through the universe and there's no meaning to any of it. It's time that we say that for real, um, conclusively, we believe that God is working and active. The kingdom of heaven is real. It's among us. We cannot see it, but God is here. And we give him the credit when he deserves the credit. Because God is working in every moment underneath and around and within us. And the kingdom of heaven is here and now because we see it. You see, the world is almost as divided as it was in Lincoln's time, in some ways. And our world is still, in a way, divided into the slaves and the free. But it's spiritually slaves to sin and set free. And it's still unseen around us and not as easy to tell because it's a spiritual war underneath of us. One day, though, it might be seen. The kingdom is in a war all around us, and I suspect, I suspect that it cannot continue in this state forever. Because one day it will be left either all slave or all free. We cannot continue in this divided state. It will come to a point of unity. And so we have to choose our side. We choose our side now before the, the physical battle comes soon. 
We have to stop denying that there is a conflict. We have to stop attributing those victories and good things to something else. We have to stop trying to avoid changing our life because we don't want to admit God is working. And we need to instead turn our life around now. Not when it comes to the point in my life to get right with God. Not when I get older and I have more time. Not when I fix some things about myself. But now, to admit God's working. We have to realize that God has been seeking us, running after us, pursuing us for years. And we've been putting it off. We've been meaning to drop that sin for years and have put it off. We have denied God's work and the good things in our life. We have wrapped our minds around only the bad things and attributed all to random chance and not realized that there is a spiritual war underneath all of it. And if you're listening here today and you are uh, feeling within you a tugging at your heart, calling you to make changes or to come to God and recognize what He is doing, then here is the one and only thing I need to tell you today. Yep, that's Jesus. Father God, I am, I am appreciative of the things that you do. God, I think, I don't know, sometimes I think that I'm supposed to um, question enough to really know and not assume because, I mean, Lord, we never know for sure. But I also think, Lord, that I'm supposed to have enough faith to give you the credit when you're working. It was the... Pharisees and others who, who sat there seeing your work, seeing the demons come out of a man, a man unable to speak, now singing praises, and still asking for a sign from God, denying that it was your power, but actually saying it was the devil. It was deeply offensive and completely illogical. I pray, God, that I might have the courage to use common sense and realize that you are acting in all sorts of moments every day in many lives. And I don't, Lord, want to fail to give you credit. I want to deny it. I don't want to attribute it to something else. I just want to look at it face to face and know that you are there. I don't want to avoid acknowledging it because I don't want to change my life yet. I pray, Lord, that I'll have the courage to change my life now. And I pray that as we go throughout this week, whether we want to post it on Facebook or email or Instagram or Twitter or even the other things I don't know about, like Snapchat, I pray, God, that um, we will take the time this week to look around and notice those areas we, that you are acting and to give you the credit for that. Because in the end, I believe, Lord, truly, yep, that's your son. And it's in the amazing name of your son who taught us to not avoid the obvious or avoid the changes, but to, to look them straight on and know what you are doing and how you are acting and to see that the kingdom of God, as we've been talking about in all this series, is here and now and among us, that you work in it every day. It's not really hidden away in some corner, as some would suggest, but it's, it's right here among us. We only have to open our eyes. That the kingdom of God is here and now, and you are at work. We thank you, God, for that, and pray that we will see the spiritual eyes to recognize it more. And in the name of your amazing Son, we pray. Amen. Um, at this point, this is our invitation song. It's a great time um, for you to...